This meeting is being recorded. All right, welcome to our Thursday night New York Giants Preservation Society meeting today with uh, Maury Bouchard. Uh, today is February 9th, and it actually today is our 100th virtual meeting. Um, sorry, I messed up a few weeks ago, but uh, you should all be proud that uh, you're here tonight and you've made this uh, station or whatever you call it session that much better by uh, regularly attending most of you. So thank you so much. And uh, let me tell you, we have a lot of news to report before we turn it over to Maury. First of all, our YouTube channel should be up and running hopefully next week. So uh, I will let you know when that is a viable product. Um, I added uh, two um, new speakers. Both of them will be in June. We're good up until June. One is David Krell, who wrote a book about the 1966 baseball season. And he's going to be talking about that and the Giants uh, perpetually finishing in second place. So that'll be one thing. And then for Mars and Harvey and, and Phil and Steve, mostly, you guys have been clamoring and talking a lot about Les Kiter. Uh, I was able to track down the author of this book, 50 Years Behind the Mic. The book is 30 years old, but the author is, uh, he, he lives in Hawaii, and he's all set to talk about Les Kiter for a whole evening. So that'll be a, a, a great thing, because a lot of you have brought his name up in the past, so you'll finally uh, get to hear more about him. Um, Russ Bertetta is here. Uh, we got, uh, I got um, notification from four of the Oracle Park um, tour guides that they'd like to join our group. So hopefully they'll come to get more meetings. Uh, they say they want to learn more about uh, New York Giant baseball. And you guys will be great uh, ambassadors of that for Russ. Um, one thing that was a good thing and a bad thing uh, Mario Aliotta will be retiring at season's end. Um, you know, he spoke to us and we gave him a list of things we'd like to get done. So unfortunately, probably uh, none of those will really come to fruition unless he has a say in his last season with the Giants. Um, I have tentatively scheduled a polo grounds tour on March 29th with Peter Laskowicz again. That is a day before opening day. They open up March 30th at, against the Yankees. Peter, Peter usually charges $50 a baseball for. Anybody who attends, it'll be free. Well, I, you know, they'll accept tips, of course. And the tour will end at the Morris Jamel uh, Mansion. And they have graciously allowed us to use their basement and Peter will be showing uh, more photographs instead of putting it on his tablet, you know, a screen there for you to see. So I will send that information out and uh, we will uh, discuss that further. Um, we'll also find out if anybody wants to go to a, a Mets game in Moss June 30th, the Friday night, if we could arrange it. And if enough people uh, want to attend, we'll, we'll do that. And finally, our next meeting will be in two weeks. It'll be on a Wednesday, though. Um, Dr. Lawrence Hogan will be discussing <clears throat> the life of his very good friend, Monty Irvin, whose birthday is, I think he'd be 104 right about that time. So that is what's on the agenda looking forward. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Maury Bouchard. Maury is going to be talking about Herman Franks from the book, uh, Team That Time Won't Forget, the 1951 New York Giants. Maury has, uh, you know, is a group member, but uh, let's all give him a nice welcome anyway for speaking tonight. Dude. Maury, the floor is yours. Maury, just, just let me know when you uh, need the... Uh... Uh, I'm ready. Okay, let me get it for you. Uh, it is all after you, Maury. Thank you. Do I get to start over? 
All right, we good? You guys can see that? Looks good. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Congratu thank you, Gary, for inviting me. And uh, congratulations, everyone, on mastering Zoom 100 times and coming off mute. I work in high tech, and I can tell you a lot of my colleagues can't manage it yet. So uh, congratulations on that big milestone. I'm proud to participate in that. Um, I don't know if any of you listen to the Rob Nyers uh, podcast from Saber, Sabercast, but he always starts uh, every interview with asking the guests what their earliest baseball memory was. Mine is probably playing around the neighborhood, but my earliest major league memory is as a seven-year-old. I distinctly remember standing in the middle of my, our living room by myself watching the seventh game of the 65 World Series, not quite understanding what was happening. And then Sandy Koufax struck out Bobby Allison to end the game and it was in Minnesota and nobody reacted. And I didn't, I didn't know if the game was over or not. But I just kind of bring that up just to place me in you know, where I'm at, what I remember. And I can start with a trivia question. The 65 uh, Dodgers had two Maurices in the starting infield. One was Maury Wills. Anybody know the other one? Wes Parker. Wes Parker is actually Maurice Wesley Parker. So two Maurices. So it's kind of Good apt question. that I, that was the first team that I really remember. So here's the book. Um, it's one of the several team books that came out from Saber. I, I started at the beginning with them when they... Bill Nowlin, who's an editor of this book, many of you will know him, um, in the Boston chapter, did a book on the 75 Red Sox in 2005. And I started with that and I did an article on Reggie Cleveland. And I participated in many books after that. And then I eventually became a fact checker on many books. I did not fact check this book, but um, I worked on as a fact checker on, on 10 or more books for Saver over the years. I don't remember why I chose Herman Franks for this. I think Bill Nowlin sent out a list of people who haven't been covered yet. And I chose, I chose Herman Franks, but I can't really tell you why. So usually I pick somebody whose last name is unusual, so it's easy to search for in newspapers.com, but um, that, that wasn't the case here. But anyways, I'm saying this because I, I know and I say with some trepidation that many of you, maybe most of you in the audience will know a lot more about Herman Franks than I do. But I, you know, what I, I haven't thought about Herman Franks uh, since 2014 when I wrote, wrote the article until Gary called me, but it's been nice getting reacquainted with him. Um, I broke this into three distinct sections. The, the player part of Herman Franks, the coach part, and the manager part. Um, he, he came into the minor leagues as an 18-year-old in the Pacific Coast League for the Hollywood Stars, and he was almost certainly too young, as it did him a disservice. He was much younger than the average person in the PCL. Back in that time in 1932, um, it, was a di you know, it was an open league. It was higher than what is now AAA. A lot of once and future major leaguers um, in the PCL. This, this quote came from the uh, Los Angeles Times. Um, Herman started a game again, an exhibition game against uh, the Marine Corps, and he got a subhead in the uh, Los Angeles Times the next day. He spent so he came up as an 18 year old in the Pacific Coast League and then he spent seven seasons in the minors. And to call them seasons is actually probably um, a stretch because he didn't travel with the Hollywood stars. He's only played in Hollywood. Um, and he only played a few games in 32 and 33. In 34, he played in the Western League which is still pretty high minors. Um, and he only played in two games in 34. And what he did the rest of the time isn't clear. He did play some semi-pro baseball around Los Angeles, but 
there's no record of him being in any other organized baseball in 34. So here he's a 20 year old, and this is basically almost a wasted year for him in baseball. The next year in 35, he, he was right sized. He was in the league he probably should have been in from the beginning, a class C league. He was in the Jacksonville, Texas, the Jacksonville Jacks of the West Dixie League that only uh, lasted, this was their last season. They, they succumbed to the depression. Then he was up in a higher minors again in 36 and then uh, Texas League and uh, now with uh, Sacramento in the Pacific Coast League, this was uh, affiliated with the Cardinals, uh, the Sacramento Solons in 37 and then again in 38. And here, are, here is the Jacksonville Jacks of 1935. And here is our hero, 21-year-old Herman Franks right there. There were a few other future major leaguers on this team. Here's Al Simmons, but not that Al Simmons. This hmm. Al Simmons had a meager career in the, in the majors. Also, Al Unser played on this team. Not that Al Unser, though. This Al Unser played a few games in the majors, but he's probably most famous for being Del Unser's father. Um, so he made his major league debut in 1939 for the Cardinals, came up from the Solons after the 38 season. Um, his first major league hit came on the 2nd of May. Um, it was his first major league start also. Well, unfortunately, he hurt his ankle uh, getting back to first base on a pickoff throw, and he missed 22 games after this. Uh, and he didn't play too much after that. The Cardinals had Mickey Owen also, so he was always going to be a backup. And then he was sent to Columbus in the American Association, again, high minors in July. He spent 40 and some of 41 with the Dodgers. Um, DeRocher and Larry McPhail saw something in in uh, Franks, it's not clear why they wanted Franks, except for that he was pugnacious. He was a DeRocher kind of guy and uh, he had a good arm and DeRocher was getting a little tired of uh, Babe Phelps. So they went out and got him, a, reportedly paid $25,000 for his contract in the off season after 39. Um, he'd spent some of the year in Montreal also in uh, 41, but uh, Phelps, Babe Phelps missed a train on a road, going to a road trip and uh, DeRocher had had enough and they called up Herman Franks and he stayed up the rest of the year. He did get one game into one game of the 41 World Series, it was his only World Series appearance. Um, he grounded into a double play uh, DeRocher had pinch hit for Owen earlier in the game, and, and so Franks had to hit for himself. Um, he was the only other catcher they had, so he had to hit for himself, and he grounded into a double play, and that was the end of the game. And um, Franks didn't appear in a major league game as it, as it happened it, and for six more years after that. And there's Herman in an action shot. Not, I could not find where this was taken or who took it or anything like that, but uh, um, I thought it was a good picture of Herman Franks in action. So his first uh, Major League home, home run, I'll just go through this uh, quickly. He was on April 23rd. He only hit three, so it won't take long. Uh, 1940, he was subbing for Phelps, who was sick or ailing or um, again. He hit a home run off of uh, Stringovich, Nick Stringovich. And uh, he also had a double and two singles. So he was four for four and helped help Tex Carlton get the win. It was Boston, um, Brooklyn's third win of the year. And that earned him the right to catch Carlton's next game, um, which was a no hitter. Carlton uh, pitched a no-hitter against the Reds, who were no uh, weaklings. They went on to win the pennant. They'd won the pennant the year before and went on to win the pennant in the World Series in 1940. But they uh, they beat the Reds. Carlton threw a no-hitter. Um, here's Herman Franks right here. I think this is Freddie Fitzsimmons here. 
This is DeRocher, of course, and Carlton. I think this is Freddie Fitzsimmons. I think this is um, Dixie Walker. Not, not sure about the others. They're not mentioned in here. Um, this was the second no-hitter of the 1940 season. Anybody remember the first one? Bob Feller. That's yeah. right. On, on opening day, Bob Feller threw a no-hitter. Gentlemen, could that be uh, Gil Hodges above Leo DeRocha or? No, huh? looks like him a little. I think this might be a, yeah, maybe it could be. I'm not sure what year he started. I, I have to admit, I didn't spend too much time. I just was still in high school in 1940. There you yeah. go, it's not in. Yeah. The second home run came the next year, June 23rd. He was, uh, he pinch hit for Freddie Fitzsimmons in the eighth. He hit it off of Bob Klinger's curve ball. And so he, it was also a three run homer. So he's got two major league home runs and both are three run homers. This one helped win the game as well. And he got his picture in the paper there. Uh, the, the game was tied four to four when he hit the home run. They went on to win nine to four. And I, I stumbled across this little little doodad here, which I th there's a little filler at the bottom of the page, um, which I know is a little bit hard to read, but Chuck Dressen, it says, whose ability to call pitches is well known, yelled, be ready to Franks a second before the latter back of the tower. That was the signal for a curve, a curveball, and that's what Franks hit. So a little um, foreshadowing of, of the sign stealing prowess there. So after the 41 season, he spent a little time in Montreal at the beginning of 42, but he enlisted in the Navy in Buffalo, New York in 1942, he was an ensign. And he went for some training and, uh, and he ended up being you know, an athletic trainer in the Navy throughout the 42 through 45, getting discharged at the beginning of 46 as a Lieutenant junior grade. He, he was stationed in Norfolk and Pensacola and Hawaii. Um, he spent all of the 46 season. He's now 32 years old. He missed uh, the best part of four seasons. Um, he's now 46, uh, 32 years old, but this was a obviously a great team, 100 win team. Uh, this may have, this is probably, arguably, uh, Frank's best season as a professional. Um, he caught 87 games, he hit 280. He had, 14 home runs, and this team went on to win the International League regular season and the pennant. Um, then Ricky sent him to St. Paul Saints in the American Association in 1947, where he was a player manager. He was the only player manager um, in that league that year. And then late in 47, Connie Mack wanted him and purchased his contract. So he's back in the back in the majors and debuted in the American League in 1947. And this turned out to be very fortuitous for Herman Franks because it allowed him to qualify for the, for the pension. And also he met his uh, future wife, Amneris Lorenza, who he married in 48. And they were married for 61 years. She's a Philadelphia native. He also played for the athletics in, uh, in 48. And this is where he hit his third major league home run. And it was on the seventh anniversary of uh, the second one. And he also, so he's something about the 23rd he liked. It was April 23rd and two June 23rds. Uh, that was his only AR homer. It was off Cliff Fannin. And he also doubled and tripled. So he seemed to get in, get into these uh, power hitting streaks when he got into them. And, he, and uh, this was a solo shot, but there was a, it was a runaway. They, they beat the Browns 12 to one. And there's Herman in a A's uniform, 1947 or 48. And overall for his career, he hit, um, he hit a 199, 80 for 403. He's in good company with other major league managers though. Tony Lurusa hit 199 for his career and Charlie Manuel hit 198. So now he's a coach. Um, after the 
48 season, DeRocher, uh, during the 48 season, of course, DeRocher went to the Giants. And then after the season, he called on Franks to come and coach. Franks asked Connie Mack for his release, which he was granted. And uh, he came to coach where he he lasted for seven, year, seven years. So, um, this, you know, this is DeRocher, obviously, Franks, Freddie Fritz-Simmons, and Frank Schellenbach. And this quartet, they stayed together uh, several years, and the Giants uniform stayed the same for several years. So it's not clear exactly what year this was taken, but it's in that range, in that 50, 51, 52 range, something like that. Um, he coached under the Giants for 49 to 55, and he left when uh, DeRocher left. Bill Rigney came on and wanted new coaches. Um, Rigney called on him to coach in San Francisco in 58. He went there, Alvin Dark asked him to coach in 64. He did that. He also coached, uh, he was a pitching coach in Chicago in 1970. Uh, DeRocher was the manager then, and their pitching coach had a heart attack. Um, Frank's happened to be in Chicago, uh, actually being a financial advisor to Willie Mays. And he was in Chicago and um, on some business related to Mays. And DeRocher asked him if he would be the pitching coach for the rest of the year, which he did. And this quote is from Carl Farillo, told this to Pete. Um, Pete Golan back in the book, The Bums, referring to Frank's and Rigney and DeRocher and all these guys. In 51, um, and this is um, a quote from Herman Franks. He told the Associated Press this in uh, 2001. I assume it was in response to the Joshua Prager article. Hi, that came out in the Wall Street Journal before the Echoing Green came out in uh, book form, it was an article in the Wall Street Journal. And I expect this was a... Um, a reaction to that. And this is Herman in 51. I don't have a lot to add here. I'm sure this topic has been discussed uh, ad nauseum in this group, and you guys have, know a lot more about it than I do. But uh, he was pretty cagey with Joshua Prager, and uh, he would admit that he had the telescope, and then he said he never heard anything about it. And so uh, it makes sense, though. He, he was extremely sharp. Um, he Joey uh, Malfitano said that Peanuts, Lowry, um, Leo DeRocher, and Herman Franks could remember a card somebody discarded five years ago. They were sharp-minded. He knew the game inside and out. He was a catcher. He was adept at getting other people's signs, and he was a DeRocher acolyte. So it makes sense, but as uh, Dan said at the beginning, it wasn't necessarily illegal at the time. And then after the... Um, 54 uh, season, um, Herman Franks went down to the to Puerto Rico and he managed what was probably the greatest Caribbean league team of all times, the 54 or 55. So I, I, I'm wearing my Santurce Crabbers jersey in, in honor of that. Um, Herman Franks, and of course this is Willie Mays and um, Roberto Clemente was also on the team, as was Don Zimmer, several other, Ruben Gomez, several other major leaguers. Uh, Don Zimmer ended up being the MVP of the uh, championship. Um, here, here Mays played 154 games, he played in the World Series. Uh, I think he was the MVP of the year that of this league that year, and then he plays another 60 games in winter ball. Pretty crazy. Uh, then he, in uh, starting in uh, 65, um, I skipped ahead a little bit here. Of course, after 55, um, Franks worked as a scout and he, he had a, a budding a real estate empire. He started buying real estate in the Salt Lake City area in um, 1948. And uh, he was a very astute businessman and he worked on that all through the rest of his life. Um, but he worked as a scout for the Giants. He bought, I'm pretty sure he was the owner or part owner of the Salt Lake City Bees in the reconstituted Pacific Coast League. Uh, he also managed a few games there. He was a general manager of the Bees. But then, as I mentioned, he was a coach under Alvin Dark in 64. 
and then Stoneham fired um, Alvin Dark on the last after the last game of the season, and he hired hired Franks for the '65 season. So he was with San Francisco, as everyone in this group knows well, from '65 through '68. Here he is on opening day with Leo DeRocher and. April 12th, 1966. And I got the uh, Zoom meeting. This is apropos, Giants. except for I like the picture. The Giants. And uh, this was uh, a quote <laughs> by Herman Franks after the 68 season was over. The 65, they were 95 and 67, 93 and 68, couldn't pass the Dodgers either year. Then they ran into the bus of the Cardinals in the next two. But his 367 wins in four years was the most in the NL, and I think in the most in the major leagues over that same period of time. He just couldn't break through and win the pennant. Of course, playoffs wouldn't be instituted until the next year. So um, he, never, he never won the pennant. He told Stoneham before the beginning of the 68 season that if he didn't win in 68, he'd re he quit, which he did, but apparently he, he regretted saying that, um, according to Joey Amalfitano. So after being out of baseball from uh, 68, uh, in that short stint in 70, again, working on the real estate empire, uh, scouting, he was um, asked to by Bob Kennedy of the of the Cubs to come and manage in Chicago, and he knew Bob Ken Bob Kennedy had managed for him in uh, Salt Lake City, so that was the connection there. So he came to Chicago, and this is a game, July twenty eighth, nineteen seventy seven. Uh, great shot. This is Jerry Crawford, and behind him, I'm pretty sure this is Doug Harvey. He was he was definitely umpiring the game. Um, but anyways, if you, this is a total aside, but if you ever get a chance, go to retrosheet.org and look up the, I, I could put the link in the chat later. Look up the box score for this game. It's just insane. I've never seen another box score like it. Um, there, it was against the Reds that it was 10, eight after three, 10, 10 after four, the Reds were up 14 to 10, and then in the eighth, the Cubs scored three. Um, they eventually tied it and won it in uh, 13. S starting pitchers won and lost the game, but not the starting pitchers of that game. Everybody was long gone. They used about 13 pitchers. But what Franks did with the infielders in that game was, I don't remember ever hearing, I mean, people much more knowledgeable on this group than I, but switching, swapping around players in the, infield based on the what side of the plate the batter was hitting. So Bobby Mercer and the second baseman in the shortstop, they were all rotating positions for several innings based on whether a right-hander or a left-hander was up. It's pretty interesting box score. Mm -hmm. And here's opening day in 79. Uh, um, the Cubs, the Chicago press, they were, they were, Pretty skeptical of Frank's, uh, Herman Frank's coming and managing here. He'd been out of baseball for a little while. He was 63 years old in 1977, by far the oldest. I think the next uh, oldest was nine years younger. Um, he was 30 years older than some managers in, uh, in the majors in 77. Um, and also, they kept talking about he was a millionaire. He wasn't hungry. He didn't need the money. He didn't need the job. And this is the beginning of free agency also. And the players are different. And Herman Franks is old school, back when old school really meant something. Um, and they, the press and the people were a bit skeptical. But he did, he did last there the best part of three seasons. He, they were fourth in 77. He was... Um, that improved on the year before, but still 20 games behind the Phillies. Uh, they regressed a little in 78. Uh, they ran out, they fell out of contention at the all-star break. And, um, and Franks quit with seven games left and he quit in kind of a 
you know, not the nicest way by telling the press that he he showed a reporter a check he'd written for twenty four thousand dollars for a country club and for fees for the next year. And he says, "You think I'm going to be managing these clowns if I've spent all this money on a membership?" He tried to take it all back, but he ended up quitting anyways after the 79 season but for his career and that was the end of his major league managing career his career is he did he did manage 1128 games not not a small amount of games and he was over 500 he won 84 games more than he lost pretty good amazingly the cubs wanted him back after after uh, what happened but the cubs started out at 81 81- season at uh, six and 27, something like that. This is the strike shortened, the gap year, but they didn't do much better under, uh, un- under uh, Frank, sorry. And uh, he, he wanted, he was the interim general manager and he wanted to be the, the full general manager the next year, but the Cubs went with Dallas Green. And this is a quote from, he should have been an owner, not an employee. This is a quote from Jerome Holtzman, who thought that the Cubs didn't didn't give Franks his due, that he was too smart, really. He was too sharp. He was way ahead of the people around him, and he, he didn't suffer fools gladly. So just a bit about his personal life. Uh, he was born the 4th of January in Price, Utah. Um, to Edith Dozy and Celeste Frank. Edith Dozy's born in Colorado. Celeste Frank is, um, was born in Italy. They were 14 years apart. The marriage uh, didn't last. So they went from Price, which is like 120 miles southeast of uh, Salt Lake City. They moved to Salt Lake City. And his mother actually encouraged him to play sports. He was a, a big sports stud at East High in Salt Lake City. And he was offered contracts and scholarships from the Yankees, Notre Dame, and others. Uh, Joshua Prager says he was the ninth Utah native to play in the majors, but I I can make it 10, uh, according to (coughs) baseballreference.com. He could have gone to a lot of schools, but he ended up enrolling at the University of Utah. And... um, but he he didn't last the year there. That's when the Hollywood Stars uh, offered him money, and he and he moved to LA to play for the Hollywood Stars. And he moved in the spring of '32, which was his freshman year. And as I mentioned, he married Amneris Lorenzen, and they were still married when he died in 2009. They had three three kids. He was elected to the Utah Sports Hall of Fame in '74. And as I mentioned, he was successful in in business and uh, was a financial um, advisor to several players, including Willie Mays and McCovey and Ernie Banks and and others. He was quite astute. And this background is the Herman Frank's uh, sports complex redo that they did a few years ago in Salt Lake City. But there's a big sports complex, outdoor fields and all that in Salt Lake City, named after Herman Franks. And this is Herman Franks and, of course, Willie Mays. Um, In 2004, when the Giants uh, honored the 50-4 team. And they were together and obviously enjoying a good good moment there. And just for completion, I've got some bits in that. But I'm happy to... uh, Take any questions or facilitate any discussion. Lori, right, that was great. The, uh, your, your pictures were, were fabulous for that. Um, I got uh, two, three comments. One is that Steve Rothschild uh, had brought up that somebody, uh, it's not always the name players that uh, we should speak about it. And this is another one. Mm. Steve talked about uh, West Western last time. So. This is great that, you know, I know you didn't get to choose the one you did, but just a wonderful job on, on, on what you did. Um, what, was, okay. Frank's, was Frank's a uh, disciple uh, of DeRoche's managing style without yes, being he, you know, belligerent? He uh, definitely uh, was. Yeah, he definitely was. He was a DeRocher kind of guy. He played for DeRocher in 40 and 41. 
Derocher obviously saw something he liked. Um, I didn't mention in the piece, but Derocher activated um, Franks for one game in 1949 because he was irritated with the effort that the team was putting out. And he wanted, um, he wanted Franks to show, you know, what a real ball player, how they play. And so he got in the game and uh, either he hit a triple or he was running the third on, on somebody else's hit. And uh, he was diving in the third and the throw from the outfield hit him in the back of the head. And uh, a big welt came up and he stayed in the game. And that was, you know, that was music to DeRocher's ears. He loved that. You know, big, here's Frank. So the, what is he in 49? He's 35 years old big welt in the back of his head and he's going up there and got a couple more hits later in the game. So yeah, he definitely, he was Drosher all the way. And lastly, you know, I've spoken on your phone to you on the phone. Whenever I see a name, all I think about is Yvonne Cornway and Serge Savard, <laughs> Montreal Canadian. So yeah. I don't right. know. <laughs> My whole life growing up, people always ask me if I played hockey. <laughs> so I'm French Canadian descent. My mother's a La Perriere. My father's mother is a Soulier. Um, there's a Deroche, my father, no, sorry, that's my mother's mother. My father's mother is a Derocher, believe it or not, from that. Um, so yeah, I always, I always had to say no, no, until 45 years old, I took up hockey. Uh, we, took should have, I, we, we should have seen you uh, sing the Canadian anthem like uh, Doucette. He was a great singer. Yes, exactly. So yeah, Maurice Richard, and there, there have been a few Bouchards in uh, in, uh, in uh, NHL. Really great job, Maury. Uh, Harvey, Thank you. Harvey, uh, there you go. Yes, I I, I am muted. Um, that was a wonderful presentation. Um, I may be wrong on this, but that game that you highlighted, July twenty eighth, nineteen seventy seven, I think Bob Costas did a piece for the Major League Baseball channel. And coincidentally, it was one of his first games that he ever broadcast. And it is indeed a wild game. And they, if that's the same game, what was the final score of that? It was, um, I think it was 14, 13. I'm looking for, yeah. the, um, I'm going to put the, the link in the chat. I'm looking for it. Yeah, here it is. Any other quick brief comment so I saw my first game on July 10th 1954 and I'm pretty sure that the third base coach that day was Herman Frank well I'm not sure if she's the third base coach because Leo used to coach third a lot but um Herman Franks was one of the coaches I remember looking at that in my dad's scorecard yeah he would have been he was there 49 to 55 in that quartet of Fitzsimmons and Schellenbach, they were together for quite yes, a while. Yes, Frank, Frank Schellenbach. And I remember my father used to refer to uh, Freddie Fitzsimmons as fat Freddie Fitzsimmons. I don't yeah. know. And you look so, at that but, picture, he's the, well, he's not as thin as uh, Schellenbach, but he's not bigger than Frank's. I no. Mean, it's really unfair. I mean, yes. <laughs> the press would get these things like the portly port cider and, or the, if the player was small, they'd call him a pony and all this. And it, it was bad, even for the time. It was, it, if nothing else, it was lazy, you know? <laughs> well, thank you very much. It was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Maury, the, one of the, one of the uh, newspaper articles, it made it almost sound like he was a good hitter. Yeah. It was like, <laughs> almost. Oh, when you showed it, I was like, why would they say that? Uh, Norm, you're up. Great, thank you for the presentation. It's very informative. Um, I'm curious if you have any stories about the 1946 season with Jackie Robinson. No, I I didn't. You know, I didn't write a book. I wrote a, a 5,000 word um, article on him, and the, I was always I was always going over on the words. Always, I I think the limit was 4,000, and they allowed me another 900 words. Okay. So no, I didn't dig. I didn't dig into that too much. All right, thank you, Mars. You're up. I'm new. Uh, hi, thank you for um, for joining us. I have um, uh, 
a, a comment about Tex Carlton. He pitched uh, against Carl Hubble in the first game of uh, a doubleheader, Cardinals and Giants, in 1933. And he went 13 innings, didn't give up a run. Carl Hubble pitched 18 innings, didn't give up a walk. Wow. And beat Carlton one to nothing. Wow. And in the second game, I believe it was um, uh, uh, Dizzy Dean faced uh, uh, Roy Parmalee, and the Giants won one to nothing. And that's a game my father worked uh, selling uh, beer and and uh, as an eighteen year old for Harry M. Stevens, and he witnessed the game. And that's one of the legacies he passed on to me. Wow, that's great. No openers in that game, I guess. <laughs> that's when pitchers threw complete games. That's right. And all plus, the time. complete plus, yeah. Mm -hmm. Maury, Thank uh, you. I, uh, one more question that I have sure. is, you know, we've had some other uh, writers who contributed to the book. What exactly was said to you guys uh you know we're doing this book uh, we want you to do this yeah. how, how did this all come about yeah I'd, I'd love to talk about that i i didn't know how much to cover on that because i was afraid that maybe you would heard it all before no. but uh, mark armor at least mark armor and maybe mark armor and bill nallen had this idea of wanting to write a short biographical essay of everyone who's ever played major league baseball so for several years and people started writing them but for several years were more people being added every year than articles being written. So they were falling behind. Bill Nowlin got this idea, well, maybe we can get people charged up by doing a whole team. You know, people fall in love with a team or they remember a team and he's a Boston guy. And so he said, and it was coming up on 2005. So he said, how about, you know, 30 year anniversary of the 75 Red Sox, the team that won the World Series three games to four. Um, <laughs> so um so that did get people charged up and so he just put it out on the boston chapter um list you know email list who wants to be volunteer writers this is what we want and the, the requirements were pretty loose back then i mean there was no sourcing <clears throat> minimal fact checking and all that but we got more professional over time so that's how i found out about it is i was on the list and I wasn't doing anything, so I, they had a, um, I was a latecomer as usual, and I picked uh, Reggie Cleveland. But they did have a style sheet, and they did have a, they never would say, well, there's a, there was a word limit, but the publisher would always put a word limit on the whole book. So eventually it would come back. Um, but over time, we got a little bit more professional, and then I really liked doing the fact checking. Um, I worked with Lyle Spatz on the 47 Yankees and the 47 uh, Dodgers book. And I just, um, I got obsessed with Bobby Bragan, um, who was, uh, who was on the 47 Dodgers as a third string catcher. And uh, the person who wrote the article didn't source how many, he, he said how many siblings he had but he didn't say what the source was. So I went to try to figure out if it was true because I was a fact checker on the article and I went to try to, I went to ancestry.com and I couldn't find the right number of siblings. So I did, I did a whole talk on this subject one time. So I won't go into all that, but it ended up with me calling um, the nephews of Bobby Bragan. they never heard anything about it. They call me back and say, my uncle wants to talk to you. So I ended up talking to 92-year-old Bobby Bragan at the beginning of 2010 and got the whole thing sorted out. And he he told me I was the only one who ever figured it out that he was adopted. He didn't want to talk about it. His kids didn't know. He and his brother, his, his, his uh, biological father died of um, tuberculosis, I think. And there was... I mean, by nowadays standards, there's nothing, you know, it was perfectly fine. They, they had tragedies. Both, both families had tragedies and ended up putting them together and making a beautiful family out of it. <clears throat> and a lot of great baseball players out of that uh, because of, some of Bobby Bregan's brothers played baseball as well. Thanks so, so much. Uh, yeah, so over time, I forget what you asked me now, but I, 
anytime I can talk about Bobby Reagan and that whole thing, uh, people were sick of it. Uh, I, I was basically saying that you, along with like Dave Lipman's here, you've had yeah. like three or four people from from that book. So yeah, it's, so they just it's, it's been brilliant. wonderful. You you get on the bio projects uh, subcommittee, and you can work individually. Like I'm. I am supposed to be working on a 19th century player, Paul Hines, but you can work individually or you can contribute to a team book. I, and, I, I, uh, I, I, we've done I, both. I, and they also I, have game, they have game projects now, yep. which is, I've done one of those. Those are fun. You don't, those are a thousand words. Anybody can do those. You, yeah, you find a game that. that you remember from your, like uh, the one that was just talked about with Tex, Carl, Tex Carlton and Carl Hubble. That would be a great, great game account somebody could write that up and uh get that on the website so yeah a lot of opportunity there if you want to write thanks dave you're up okay uh kudos to you gary again for getting these guys like we, we talked about you know some of the the minor players but it's still of interest to our group that book is fabulous because it covers everybody that was on that 51 team right. i know you alluded to the fact that you know franks didn't really want to talk about that 1951 season a lot with the telescope and stuff and I remember when specifically when Prager came out to visit me in Arizona and I think it was right before right the kind of before Frank's passed away he made a visit to him and he really opened up you know the book was already out it wasn't going to be redone oh. the guy was not that he was dying but he wasn't well and everything that he didn't want to discuss he discussed and Prager said you know I wish I had this interview before the book came out, but I'm going to, you know, take this along with everything else I got. He was so cordial in his house and all the memorabilia that he had probably from that season and everything else. But he did a great job. And, uh, you know, it's a tough topic, but great job. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Anybody else have a question for, uh, for Maury? Judge, you're up. There you go. I, I just want to know about um, his tenure as Giants manager in the late 60s. That's when I first started really following the Giants, uh, you know, about 10 years old. And um, he came in, they came in second so many years in a row. W was he popular or w was he getting the blame for coming in second? Or was there a consensus? Well, the Dodgers and Cardinals just happened to have outstanding teams those years. But what, was he a popular manager? I think he was popular there, but they also had really good players. Yeah, I mean, you're yeah. look, you got Mason, Marichal, and yeah, and McCovey, Perry and Mayla McCovey, and yeah, and Perry. Yeah, I mean, Alvin Dark got fired basically for underachieving, and then, um, you know, the next year Frank's wins. I think it was what was it, ninety five games for that team. Willie Mays had an awesome 1965, obviously just came up a little bit short. I mean, it's not that they played terrible. It's just like the Dodgers were on fire the last 16 or 17 games of the season. I think the Dodgers were 15 and one or 16 and one, something like that in 65. The Giants were above 500, but they just couldn't hold them off. So he wasn't taking a lot of heat for it. And not that, not that I know of, I can't say, again, I didn't dive in that deeply in things. And there's probably other people on this call who know more about that than I do. And that comment Giants were hurt that, by the Marischal suspension that year. The Marischal suspension killed him. Um, that comment, second place ain't too bad. When did he make that? And uh, he made I, that. He made that in uh, after the '68 season. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, it's not I, so I, evil. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I, I I don't think anybody get away with saying <laughs> that these days. <laughs> okay, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Judge. Anybody anybody else with a question? I'm gonna judge. Russ, I'm going to try to, this Russ, is Russ, I'm going to try to jump in. Go ahead. You got to unmute now, Russ. You muted yourself. Okay. Go ahead. All right. Can you hear me? Yep. So uh, just in response to that um, uh, question about whether he was popular. So I was uh, I was a teenager, 15, 16, and, and uh, uh, loved going to the games. My grandfather was a ticket taker at Candlestick and at Seal. So, you know, I could go basically free anytime that I wanted to. And well, um, Franks was not overly popular. He wasn't reviled. I mean, the Giants were really good. And then like the last person mentioned, the, the Marischal suspension just killed him that year. Um, 
And it was, uh, you know, they were just, they were good, but they didn't have that third pitcher and uh, like the Dodgers did. So it, it was, it was frustrating for, for all of us that were, you know, were giant fans at that time. And the, the other thing I wanted to mention was uh, the Giants brought Masanori Murakami up in, in 1965, the first Japanese player. And there was real little preparation. And I remember the, the story going around the, the, I think maybe it was the first time that uh, uh, Masanori pitched for the Giants. Uh, they bring him out of the bullpen and, and Herman Franks goes out there with a uh, Spanish to English uh, uh, translation book because he thought maybe that you know nobody could speak Japanese on the Giants and they thought well, maybe Murakami can understand Spanish and that that was a failure. So you know when uh, when Franks was removed after uh, the '68 season, nobody was you know weeping when he when he got fired uh, and he was better than Clyde King, uh, but he just wasn't. I don't know. He he wasn't that great. And like I said, Giants didn't really mourn the passing or the loss of the firing of uh, Herman Frank. So um, anyway, I've enjoyed this a lot. Any, anybody else? What I just say about Murakami is that uh, he hasn't been claimed on the Sabre bio project. So he would be fascinating, I think, to write about somebody so inclined. Well, there's a book on him. There's a yeah, so there's information out oh, yeah. there on him, and so it wouldn't be that hard to, and I'm sure it, if you can get access to the San Francisco papers from the relevant period of time, you can get a lot of information, so it wouldn't be all that hard either, so be a good one to write about. Anybody else with a question or a comment? Yeah. Well, go ahead, go ahead uh, Dave. Yeah, uh, actually, it's a double question. Um, you know, you you said that uh, her, about Herman Frank's uh, the varying opinions uh, the 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 players have. I think they're about you know they're they're like all uh, managers. What did did Herman Franks have to say about the players that he led? And I guess the other one is a little more personal. Is how'd you like my essay in the Fifty One Giants book? Who did you write about? Oh, I wrote the piece at the very end about the 51 Giants reunion on the 50th anniversary. Ah, I, I'll read it again. I know that I've read it, but I, I don't uh, I don't recall. I'm more, I'm more interested in what, what he thought of a lot of the players he had uh, working for him. Yeah, I don't have any I don't have any quotes on that or anything like that. I know that at the end of his tenure with the Cubs, he he was disgusted with the players. Okay. And, but what he thought about individual players, I mean, obviously he stayed um, close to Mays and McCovey. Um, but I didn't, I, again, it's been a while, but I don't recall running across anybody saying a bad word about, um, you know, players having uh, a lot of trouble with Franks, although I'm sure some of them did, especially on the Cubs. Mm. Um, these guys who were, in their 20s and Frank's in his 60s. Right. Um, I'm, I'm about to turn 65. I can't imagine managing hey, I, a, hey, I'm 60 <laughs> myself. I can manage the meat market. Yeah. A anybody else with a comment before we wrap it up? Just want to welcome Joan Chin to uh, the session. She also is in Oracle Park uh, tour guide. So nice to see her. Maury, oh, yeah. just fabulous. Thank okay, you. Let's give it up for Maury Bouchard. Thank you. Thank you again very much. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. It was great. Maury, I know you're in the group, but, you know, stop by when we have another uh, session. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm, planning to, I'm planning to participate when I can, for sure. Perfect. Uh, I will hang around here if you want to talk some giant baseball. Um, next meeting, uh, no meeting next week. It'll be in two weeks on the Wednesday with uh, Larry Hogan. I'm closing out. Right. Have a great well, night, everybody. Thanks. Happy Valentine's Day to uh, anybody who celebrates. Thank you. Oh, good job. Be well, take care, guys. Good job. Be